Good morning, everyone. This week, we're going to be talking about Marissa Acocello Marchetto's Cancer Vixen. This work is a graphic memoir um, about the author's experience with breast cancer. I'd like to give you a little bit of background on Marchetto, and then I'd like to talk about some ways in which we can discuss and think about this work. Uh, first of all, Marchetto was born in 1962. Uh, she began her career in the 1980s, working on the creative and artistic side of several Madison Avenue advertising firms, um, rising from you know, artistic director to finally the senior vice president. Um, at the same time that she was working in advertising, she was writing um, an ongoing cartoon strip about an unnamed New York City fashionista um, who is in some ways meant to be her alter ego. And in the cartoon, this woman is referred to only as she. In 1993, uh, Marchetto published um, a book, a graphic work called Just Who the Hell Is She Anyways, which is meant to be a follow-up to that um, comic strip that she, was, um, that she was writing. From there, she made a career switch from advertising to working as a freelance comic writer um, where she wrote for um, The New Yorker, The New York Times, uh, Talk Magazine, Glamour, and Oh, The Oprah Winfrey Magazine, um, among other publications. Um, at the age of 43, she was diagnosed with stage one breast cancer, and her work explores um, you know, the year that she spent undergoing treatment for that cancer. Originally, um, this work was published as a six-page cartoon feature, in Glamour Magazine in 2005. From there, it was published in 2006 in the form that we see now, which is the much longer memoir version, Cancer Vixen. Um, now the title comes from the fact that she didn't really like calling herself a cancer vixen, victim, excuse me, so she preferred to call herself um, a cancer vixen. The book was one of Time Magazine's top 10 graphic novels and it became a finalist in the National Cartoonist Society um, Graphic Novel of the Year Award. Um, and if you look at the back, you'll notice that some of the proceeds from this work go to cancer charities. So um, I want to think about some ways in which we might um, conceptualize this work and begin to kind of understand um, what it's doing. First of all, it is somewhat unusual for a cancer survivor story um, in a couple of ways. Um, and the first I want to talk about is sort of her, um, her writing, um, and the way that she is thinking about her experience. Um, the story itself is pretty humorous, which I think is unusual to find in a cancer survivor story. Um, it's pretty frank too, um, about the things that she goes through. And it really talks about um, the complexities of, um, of cancer and the way it impacts her life. Um, some of the big things that she goes through are things like having no insurance. And she's very careful about talking about the impact of that. And also at the end, detailing how much her cancer treatment would have cost her had she not had insurance. Um, you know, from there, she also talks about the big issue of trying to fit cancer into her, you know, emotional, professional, and just everyday life. Um, at the beginning, when she finds out, for example, she's really worried that her partner is going to leave her. She also explores some of the kind of, we might say, um, less big picture issues about having cancer. For example, she's terrified of losing her hair. Um, so that's one of several ways in which she talks about the cancer, talks about some of the symptoms of, or pardon me, the side effects of her treatment. So there's these sort of thematic ways in which she talks about cancer, but then there's also the kind of visual representation of what's going on in the story. And I think this is perhaps what makes her work in some ways most unusual of all. First and foremost, her story is told in graphic form. And there's a lot of things that we can look for um, when we're reading a graphic novel. So what I want to do is give you guys sort of a short introduction to reading a graphic novel. All right, so let's switch over to my handy dandy PowerPoint. All right, my PowerPoint is entitled A Few Tips for Reading a Graphic Memoir. What this will do is provide you with some additional analytic tools that you can use when exploring Marchetto's work. 
First and foremost, you might be wondering what is a graphic memoir? You might hear me refer to it as a graphic novel. Um, whether a novel or a memoir, a graphic memoir is um, a work in which the words and images work together to form an artistic whole. And the meaning of the work um, depends upon um, the interplay between the words and the images. And when we're reading a graphic memoir, we can interpret it through using a combination of visual and literary tools. Now, we've already had our introduction to looking at literary or rhetorical tools. We've been looking at these tools since I think probably the first week. Some of the tools that we can use when reading literature in order to um, better understand what's going on include things like tone or voice, um, metaphors or textual depictions. We can look at dialogue versus description, structures or repetitions, grammar and word choice. We can look at ambiguities in the text. We um, talk about those as being a place where um, you know a given word or phrase seems to mean more than one thing at the same time. We can look at traditions or conventions. That is, we can look at what the expectations are for a particular genre and then how readers, or pardon me, how writers might be disrupting this convention. And then we can finally look at images as part of our rhetorical tool set. When we're looking at a comic though, we will be using those rhetorical tools um, in conjunction with this set of visual tools that I have on the screen right now. And those visual tools include things like the size of the pictures against the page, color, the depiction of images, the strength of the lines used, the medium or the media used, the setting, the text formatting, and finally the relationship between the text and the picture. So let's delve into a couple of these. Um, first, I want to talk about the size of pictures against the page. And what I mean by this is if you're looking at a comic, particularly at a comic book like this one, you can imagine um, the overall um, like canvas of the work being the individual page. So what we can do is explore the way that individual um, framed images um, for each one of those comics are set up against the page. Um, as a whole. Are they meant to be really little within the page? Are they meant to take up the entire page? I'll give you an example actually from a children's book. This is from a book called Into the Night Kitchen. On the left hand side you'll notice that there's a comic of a little boy. He's shouting quiet down there. Um, this is what this image looks like on the page of the book. So what you'll notice is that you actually have a quite a quite a great bit of white space but if you turn over here, which is in the middle of the book, what you can see on the right hand side is actually that there is no frame. Um, we see no white around that indicates that page in the background. Instead, the visual image has actually overtaken um, those two pages that would be on either side of a book when you open it. All right, the second visual tool you can use is color. Questions you can ask yourself include, you know, how much color is used and where is it being used? Does the entire illustration include color or is color used selectively? For example, is it only used to outline one character or two characters? What type of color is being used? Um, things like reds, orange, and yellows are thought to add excitement, whereas blues and greens tend to be more tranquil. And how saturated are those colors? Are those colors meant to really um, sort of pop out of that image or are they meant to be really subdued? So I'll give you an example. Um, this is actually another children's book. It's called Olivia. And what you'll notice here is that this um, is actually a line drawing in black and white, but there are two um, instances where color stands out. One is actually Olivia herself, who is the little girl pig. She's wearing a red dress. And the other one is the painting that she's looking at. And so as a reader, I know immediately that I am supposed to be paying attention to Olivia and then also to the painting that Olivia is looking at. The third set of um, visual tools, tools that we can use include the depiction of the images. Um, and I want you to think about this in a couple of ways. One thing you can ask yourself is, are these images meant to be realistic or are they stylized? Um, are they always realistic? This is a long novel. 
you know, does um, Marchetto always depict herself as being re realistic? Does she ever depict herself in ways that are stylized? Um, does she ever flip back and forth? And secondly, does the author rely on what I would call visual conventions? And I mean this in two ways. First of all, comics conventionally tell a story through depicting images inside of a frame, right? We're used to seeing this if you open up comics in the newspaper, you usually have four or five frames, um, and you don't typically see the comic coming out of the frame. So when a comic comes out of the frame, it shows that the author is departing away from our conventional understanding of what a comic looks like. And secondly, the author may, in addition, rely on other visual conventions that would include images that we're already familiar with and we understand symbolically. So for example, when um, Marchetto pictures death, she pictures um, a man in a hood with a scythe because she knows that culturally we understand that man to symbolize death. Um, so I'll give you an example of depiction of images. Um, this is an example from Marchetto's comic. What you'll notice here, I'll, what you'll notice is that we've got um, f these sort of framed comics on the top and bottom um, of the page. These are more conventional comics, but in the middle of in the middle of these two comics, she is actually creating an image that is not um, held in any kind of a frame, and um, so you know instead it seems to sort of exist on its own. And that is meant to be jarring to us. We are meant to understand that something else is going on. In this case, what she's doing is she's almost doing um, what looks like a visual jump cut um, as though she was an editor, um, actually going back in time um, several years. All right, I want to look at a couple more tools. Another one is media. By media, I mean what kinds of um, drawing or painting materials is the author using? Does the illustrator use watercolors? Does she use photographs, oil painting, chalk, etc.? Comic writers typically use marker. And does the illustrator mix media at all? Are there points in Cancer Vixen where the author is including things like images or artwork? So I'll give you an example of one place where I see her doing this. Um, what you see here is um, Marchetto's um, it's an example of the way that she covered 9-11. Um, I believe it was for Talk Magazine. So what's going on here is you actually have a traditional comic, right, which is the comic that she wrote, but what she's actually doing is she's citing a comic that she wrote. So she gives you here not just the comic, but actually the comic as it would have appeared in Talk Magazine. So this is an example of a place where she is... Um, mixing two different types of comic. It's almost like she's giving you a visual block quote where what she has is first, this is the comic that's part of her story, right? This is the narrative, what you see right here. Um, and then what you have in addition, the visual image is actually um, a quote that she's giving you. In addition, we can also look at setting. So setting might include questions like, does the author include background color or not? If not, is that background fanciful or is it meant to be realistic? Is it fully realized or is it just really sketchy in terms of its details? And is it different from um, the foreground? Is she, um, does she want us to kind of forget what's going on in the setting or does she really want us to understand the setting in total? So I'll give you two examples of the way that two different illustrators have rendered setting. On the left-hand side is a children's work called Harold and the Purple Crayon. And what you'll notice is there's actually no setting or the setting is incredibly sketchy. What we have here is the image of the little boy. He's the main character in the foreground. But the background is just the barest of line drawings um, that is meant to establish that this boy is in space. And if you've ever read Harold and the Purple Crayon, the reason why it does it is that this is a story about a little boy using a drawing tool to create his own reality. Now on the right hand side, we have another children's work work. It's called King Bidgoods in the Bathtub. And here what you'll notice is that this setting is meant to be incredibly realistic. And in fact, what should be a kind of setting that perhaps is in the background is now foregrounded. We don't see necessarily a character um, standing, um, being like standing out from a background. Instead, we see this entire setting becomes almost like becomes the character, becomes the main focus of the text. 
And I want to look at text formatting. That's another thing I want you to be aware of. By text formatting, I'm literally talking about what the letters look like on the page. You know, what font has been used? Is it big or small um, in relation to the images? Is it in capitals or is it in lowercase letters? Is it in um, a formal type font or in this case, is it handwritten? So I'll give you an example. This is from um, a parody, um, a visual parody of a fairy tale collection called The Stinky Cheese Man. And what you'll notice here is that the author is actually really playing with font. So he starts out with this really big font, Once Upon a Time. That font gradually gets smaller. Um, so that by the time you're in the middle of the page, the font has, um, has, has actually visi visi visibly decreased in size. And by the time you get down to the end of the page, the font actually has come to the point where you can no longer read it. It's so small. In addition, the author has, um, has decided that he will ignore um, formatting. He's going to ignore creating um, headers and footers and instead have the text literally just run off the page. Um, and that's being done for, um, for a visual and connotative reason because um, this author is actually playing with um, the very idea of what we expect from our written books. Okay, so the final, let's see if this is the final. Yep, the final tool that I want us to look at is the relationship between the text and the picture. Um, now, we know that when we are analyzing um, any kind of comic or graphic novel, we are always attending to that relationship that's established between the text and the image because in that interplay is where we find deeper meaning in the text. That's where we find our connotation. But I want us to think strategically about how the text and pictures are set up. So is the text meant to be separated from the image? Um, is it included inside the image? Um, is it meant to be an integral visual aspect to the image itself? That is that the image wouldn't actually exist without the text. And I'll give you Another example, I'm going to return back to Marissa Marchetto's um, visual depiction of, um, of her interviews with first responders on 9-11, because this is a great example of the relationship between text and image. Um, and it's actually going on in a couple of different levels, but I'm just going to focus on um, the original comic itself. First of all, what you have is she's drawn a map as well as a timeline. So in this sense, um, she, the background to what's going on is, um, is all an image, is, um, is an image in which the text is an integral part because we're supposed to be reading down the timeline and then also following at the bottom of the page where she begins her walk and then all the people that she runs into. So they're all numbered. And then these numbers correspond with her different interviews. And here, what you see is that the text actually, um, like the, um, the text boxes actually um, occur in the middle of the, um, the people whose portrait she's drawing. So the text becomes something that we're meant to look at just as much as we are um, the individual people that she's, um, that she's talking to. All right, so what I wanna do here is just recap the various tools that you can use when you are interpreting this work. You can use a set of rhetorical tools for looking at precisely what's been written on the page. You can look for things like tone or voice, metaphors or textual images, dialogue versus description, structure and repetition in terms of her, the words that she's using, um, her grammar and her word choice, any ambiguities. Um, so for example, she constantly refers to her mother as um, a smother and that becomes you know, kind of a, a, an ambiguous sort of like in joke, tradition or conventions or images. The visual tools you can use when examining her illustrations include the size of the pictures against the page, colors, the way that she depicts her images, the medium or media used, the setting, the textual formatting, and the relationship between the text and the pictures. All right, I've given you guys a lot of information um, I think what we should do now is head over to the discussion board where we will begin to think about how to use some of those tools. Thank you so much.